Welcome everyone to Have History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and today I will tell you the story of Reverend Walsh, who accompanied a patrol ship that sailed the waters of the African coast looking for slave ships because they had been outlawed. Slavers still risked getting caught with human cargo to make a profit in Brazil and other places in the Americas. Here is the first-hand account of Walsh when he boarded a slaver ship captured by a patrol ship on May 22, 1829. She was a very broad deck ship with a main mast, a schooner rigged, and behind her foremast was that large formidable gun which turned a broad circle of iron on deck and which enabled her to act as a pirate if her slaving speculation failed. She had taken in, on the coast of Africa, 336 males and 226 females, making in all 562, and had been out 17 days, during which she had thrown overboard 55. The slaves were all enclosed under grated hatchways between decks. The space was so low that they sat between each other's legs and were stowed so close together that there was no possibility of their lying down or at all changing their position by night or day. As they belonged to and were shipped on account of different individuals, they were all branded like sheep with owner's marks of different forms. These were impressed under the breast or on the arms, and as the mate informed me with perfect indifference, burnt with a red-hot iron. As soon as the poor creatures saw us looking down on them, their dark and melancholy visages brightened up. They perceived something of sympathy and kindness in our looks, which they had not been accustomed to, and feeling instinctively that we were friends, they immediately began to shout and clap their hands. One or two had picked up a few Portuguese words and cried out, Viva! Viva! The women were particularly excited. They all held up their arms, and when we bent down and shook hands, they could not contain their delight. They endeavored to scramble up on their knees, stretching up to kiss our hands, and we understood that they knew we were come to liberate them. Some, however, hung down their heads in apparently hopeless dejection. Some were greatly emaciated, and some, particularly children, seemed dying. But the circumstance which struck us most forcibly was how it was possible for such a number of human beings to exist packed up and wedged together as tight as they could cram. In low cells three feet high, the greater part of which, except that immediate under the grated hatchways, was shut out from light or air, and this when the thermometer exposed to the open sky was standing in the shade on our deck at 89 degrees. The space between decks was divided into two compartments, three feet by three inches high, the size of one was 16 by 18, and the other 40 by 21. Into the first were crammed the women and girls, into the second the men and boys. 226 fellow creatures were thus thrust into one space 288 feet square, and 336 into another space 800 feet square, given the hole on average of 23 inches, and to each of the women not more than 13 inches. We also found manacles, the fetters of different kinds, but it appears they had all been taken off before we boarded. The heat of these horrid places was so great, and the odor so offensive that it was quite impossible to enter them, even had there been room. They were measured as above when the slaves had left them. The officers insisted that the poor suffering creatures should be admitted on deck to get air and water. This was opposed by the mate of the slaver, who from a feeling that they deserved it, declared they would murder them all. The officers, however, persisted, and the poor beings were all turned up together. It is impossible to conceive the effect of this eruption. 517 fellow creatures of all ages and sexes, some children, some adults, some old men and women, all in a state of total nudity, scrambling out together to taste the luxury of a little fresh air and water. They came swarming up like bees from the aperture of the hive, till the whole deck was crowded, to suffocation front stem to stern, so that it was impossible to imagine where they could all have come from or how they could have been stowed away. On looking into the places where they had been crammed, there were found some children next to the sides of the ship, in the places most remote from air and light. They were lying nearly in a torpid state after the rest had turned out. The little creatures seemed indifferent as to life or death and when they were carried on deck, 
many of them could not stand. It was not surprising that they should have endured much sickness and loss of life in their short passage. They had sailed from the coast of Africa on the 7th of May and had been out but 17 days, and they had thrown overboard no less than 55 who had died of dysentery and other complaints in that space of time. Though they had left the coast in good health, indeed many of their survivors were seen lying about the decks in the last stage of emaciation and in a state of filth and misery not to be looked at. Even-handed justice had visited the effects of this unholy traffic on the crew who were engaged in it. Eight or nine had died, and at the moment six were in the hammocks on board in different stages of fever. This mortality did not arise from want of medicine. There was a large stock ostentatiously displayed in the cabin with a manuscript book containing directions as to the quantities. While expressing my horror at what I saw, and exclaiming against the state of this vessel for conveying human beings, I was informed by my friends who had passed so long a time on the coast of Africa and visited so many ships that this was one of the best they had seen. The height sometimes between decks was only 18 inches, so that the unfortunate beings could not turn around or even on their sides, the elevation being less than a breadth of their shoulders, and here they are usually chained to the decks by the neck and legs. In such a place, the sense of misery and suffocation is so great that the blacks, like the English in the black hole at Calcutta, are driven to a frenzy. They had on one occasion taken a slave vessel in the river of Bonnie. The slaves were stowed in the narrow space between decks and chained together. They heard a horrible din and tumult among them and could not imagine from what cause it proceeded. They opened the hatches and turned them up on deck. They were manacled together in twos and threes. Their horror may be well conceived when they found a number of them in different stages of suffocation. Many of them were foaming at the mouth, and in the last stage of agony, many were dead. A living man was sometimes dragged up, and his companion was a dead body. Sometimes of the three attached to the same chain, one was dying and the other was dead. The tumult that they had heard was the frenzy of those suffering wretches in the last stage of fury and desperation, struggling to extricate themselves. When they were all dragged up, 19 were irrecoverably dead. Thank you so much for watching. I hope this illuminates the fact that even though the United States and Britain had outlawed the slave trade, and they attempted to stop the slave trade by issuing these patrols, slavers still existed well into the 19th century, and they would secretly take slaves to places in the United States, the Caribbean, and South America. Thank you again for watching. Have a great day.